the kids would like to head out uh, to the back room across the way, then they are uh, more than welcome to do so. Um, just as they uh, leave us, if you'd like to grab your Bible and open it up to Isaiah chapter 55. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, um, there are some around on the seats and also at the table on the desk. I would encourage you to have that open in front of you so you can track uh, along with me and see that it's coming from God and not me. Um, so Isaiah chapter 55, I'm just going to read that for us, uh, and then we're going to think about what these things mean for our lives today. Isaiah chapter 55, um, verses 1 to 13. This is the word of the Lord. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth sprout, and giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Let me just pray for us, and then we'll think about these things. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself we thank you that although you are so other than us, that you're so holy, so above us, yet you have chosen to come down to us, to reveal yourself to us, and to invite us to know you. Just pray now for your Spirit's help as we come before your word, that we would be humble before it, that we would be soft-hearted, ready to listen, and ready to respond in obedience and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so um, over the past summer, at the end of August, we had a chance to attend a, a family wedding, which was great, great opportunity to get all of our family together and attend a wedding. But I don't know how you respond when an invitation comes through the door, a, a wedding invitation. Um, it, I kind of noticed over a period of time as I've been married how men and women respond differently to wedding invitations. Girls gravitate towards the, the finer details in a wedding, don't they? Uh, they like to talk about the dress, which for me is just like this whole other language that comes out. A-line and all these kind of things. No idea what that's all about. And then maybe, uh, well, at least for me anyway, I don't want to speak for all guys here, but my mind kind of goes towards, oh, I'm getting a full day out here at someone else's expense, <laughs> particularly a nice big meal. You know, you get the food after the wedding, then you get the meal, then you also get the evening food if you um, can stick around for that. Now, I guess that's just kind of, maybe that's just me, but everyone loves a free meal, right? But the reality is when it comes to a wedding or anything like that, the meal's not really free because you have to buy a gift, don't you? The meal's not really free and you still wake up the next day hungry. Isaiah 55 that we've just read is God's invitation to a meal, a feast, Revelation 19.9 really pictures what this feast will turn into. It's, it's described as a, a wedding banquet, a wedding feast. And here's two things that are true of this meal, of this feast. It's free, it's truly free, and it's eternally satisfying. You don't wake up hungry the next morning. And it's not just a normal invitation. It's not just a, a normal invitation. It's an urgent, eternal appeal to you and me. So if you're a Christian here this morning and you've already accepted that invitation, then 
Isaiah 55 is here to remind you and to cause you to rejoice in what you've already been invited into, to be reminded and to rejoice in what is already yours. Maybe you don't know Jesus this morning or you used to follow him. The invitation here this morning is to take up this invitation in in Isaiah 55 with urgency because it's one of eternal significance and promises everlasting rewards. And maybe as we think about these things as a church, as we come to uh, our, our year anniversary, this is the incredible invitation we get to proclaim. This is the incredible invitation we get to proclaim. And these verses give us rock-solid assurances as we give our lives to do that. Rock-solid assurances as we seek to defend and declare and display the beauty and the truth of this invitation. And ultimately, as we'll see, it's an invitation not to come to something, but to come to someone, to Jesus. So that's what we're going to see this morning. This passage is calling us to respond by coming confidently to Jesus, empty-handed, and receive everlasting satisfaction in life. To come to Jesus confidently, empty-handed, and receive everlasting satisfaction in life. If you look down at verse 1, the first part of God's invitation is this. He invites us to come and be satisfied. And if you notice in those verses, you see the word come is is said four times there. So this isn't some kind of polite, uh, for the sake of it kind of invitation. It's not the kind of wedding wedding invitation you might give to a, a second cousin in the hope that they maybe might not come so you can invite a close friend. It's not just a for the sake of it polite invitation. It's a wholehearted come, 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 come invitation that really wants you to be there. What kind of meal are we being invited to? Well, it's not a a literal banquet or meal. It's a salvation meal. It's a meal that represents the offer of salvation, of satisfaction and eternal life. That's what the rest of the chapter will go on to show us. It's a meal that began all the way back in the garden where our first parents, Adam and Eve, were invited to take and to eat. Yet they chose to eat of the one tree that they were forbidden of and instead chose to die. Yet God in his mercy and grace offers salvation throughout the whole of history. We saw the the Passover meal, the bread and water in the wilderness, the milk and honey in the promised land, the feeding of the 5,000, which all culminated in Jesus himself in John 6 saying, I am the living bread. Take and eat of me. I am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And it's a meal that if you're a part of the church and you're a Christian, it's a meal that you remember now through the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. And that meal is meant to point towards the final feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. Who's this meal for? Verse 1, if you look down, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. There's no VIP list or VVIP list. It's for those who have nothing. You don't need to bring anything with you to come to this meal. Actually, what qualifies you to come is that you recognize that you have nothing. That's what we've been thinking about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. This is the memory verse our kids have been memorizing over this last while. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who recognize their sin and need of a Savior. How is it free? Because as we've just sang, Jesus has already paid the price in full that enables us to come. Jesus took our sin upon himself. Sin is, as one of my close friends once helpfully put it to me, stuff you, God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. That's essentially what sin is. Stuff you, God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. Jesus took our rebellion and our rejection of him, of of God on himself, bore the wrath of God on the cross for us, died yet was resurrected so that we might not die eternally, but have eternal life. Isaiah 53, just a couple of chapters earlier from where we're at this morning, says this, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The invitation of Isaiah 55 is possible because of Isaiah 53. It's for everyone. 
It's free and it satisfies. It satisfies. The reality is that you and I have a a deep internal longing for something more. Ecclesiastes talks about, does not how God has set eternity on man's heart, a a deep longing for something more, for someone more, for eternity. And that something more is a relationship with the one who created us. Whether we choose to recognize him or not, our souls will not be satisfied until they find their rest in him, until we seek him. Yet if we're honest, if we look at our lives even now, or maybe we look at our past lives, we look for that satisfaction elsewhere. If you look down at verse 2, that's what it tells us. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Why do you spend, why do we spend our money, maybe literally, our, our labor, that is our time and our efforts for things that are fakes, things that are not bread? That's what it says in verse 2. This might be slightly controversial, but it's kind of like buying supermarket brand cereal rather than the real deal, right? It's like buying supermarket brand cereal. Nothing wrong with it, by the way. I eat it every morning. But it's just not the real deal, is it? My mom tried to fool me into thinking it was growing up. It's not the real deal. We try to take good things. We try to take good things and make them something they just aren't. They just aren't. We take good things given to us by God, like family, children, relationships, love, sex, food even, and we elevate them to the place of God things. We make them, as the the preacher and author Tim Keller phrases, as counterfeit gods. We buy fake things and turn them into, try to turn them into real things. He says this, if we look to some created thing to give us meaning, hope, and happiness— that only God himself can give, it will eventually fail to deliver and break our hearts. Has that been true of you? We give meaning and hope and happiness to something else that only God can give us. And it's failed us. Maybe it is failing us this morning and it's breaking our hearts. It does not satisfy. It will never truly fulfill us. And not only do these things not satisfy us, but they lead to death. Proverbs 9, 13 to 18 is in some ways the contrasting invitation to Isaiah 55. Um, the, the, The invitation of foolishness, of death, as Proverbs 9 says this, the, the woman folly is loud. So wisdom here, foolishness is pictured as a a woman speaking. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stole more sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Choosing to reject this invitation and take up that one instead is to, 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 to dine at the table of self-indulgence and fake gods, though it may taste sweet for a while, which it will, though it may taste sweet and pleasant for a while, is ultimately to dine at the table of death. But that doesn't have to be the case. Verse 2 Listen, diligent to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Listen. Don't listen to her. Don't listen to that invitation. Listen to me. Listen, diligent to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Listen up, come, and eat what is good. Wine and milk represent there the richest of foods are on offer. Stop seeing satisfaction in things that only taste sweet for a second, but leave you feeling empty in the end. Come and eat the best food and experience delight instead of death. God invites us to come and be satisfied and to listen and live. Verse 3, if you look down, incline your ear to me and come to me and hear that your soul may live. As we said at the beginning, this invitation is a matter of life and death. Therefore, we're being called to listen up and hear that our soul might live. 
and see what God is offering to us here, an everlasting covenant, an, an eternal promise. A, a covenant really is biblical language for a contract, but it's a contract with love, and it's not just any ordinary love. It's God's love. It's a covenant grounded in God's steadfast love. That's what it says there. This invitation from God is not just an invitation to be a guest at a wedding. It is an invitation to be the very bride of Christ, to sit at the top table, to be loved and cherished for all eternity, to be redeemed, to be healed, to be resurrected, and to live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. It's not an ordinary invitation. This is the the love that God showed to King David through the Davidic covenant, which now comes to us in King Jesus through the new covenant. God made uh, David, that's what these verses are, are telling us, God made David king and ruler of God's people Israel in the Old Testament, who were always meant to draw the nations to themselves, weren't they? They were meant to be a light to the nations. They were meant to draw the whole world to God. That's what verse 4 and 5 are really getting at. Now in King Jesus, great David's greater son, the nations are now again being called in. The invitation to come, therefore, is for every tribe and language and people and nation. Jesus is the eternal king who rules and reigns over everything now and in the age to come. That means for you and me, we're to invite people to come to Jesus indiscriminately. No matter their tribe, no matter their language, no matter their nation, we get to see the nations come to Jesus. As a church, it means we must be ready and willing to embrace people of all backgrounds. It means as a church... We don't just play our part in what's going on here, locally, even nationally, but we are obligated and have the privilege of playing the part of spreading the good news of Jesus globally too. That's why we're part of a global network. That's why we partner with all our churches, our sending church to plant churches here in Scotland and to do God's work throughout the globe through our network as well. It means that we get to live now under the rule and reign of Jesus, obediently, Yes, at an earthly cost, but confidently. It means we can take heart in our mission as a church. Look at verse 5. The nations will run to Jesus. The nations will come to him. His church will be built, as Derek prayed. People will be saved and transformed. This nation will. This town, this nation, all nations are not without hope. So God invites us to come and be satisfied, to listen and live, and to seek and be forgiven. This invitation isn't issued to people who've got it all sorted. It's issued to people like you and me, sinners, people who've fallen short, people who have, still do, turn their back on God and reject Him. Yet He has not rejected us ever. He calls us to seek Him. That's what verse 6 says. Seek Him, to seek the the Lord. The, 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 The word used there is God's personal covenant name, to seek the Lord personally. And to seek Him, not just for what He can give us or what He can fix for us, but because of Himself. To seek Him for Himself, recognizing that He Himself is all we need in this life and in the life to come. And if you look down, we're to do that urgently while he may be found. It's not something that can wait. We can't just put the invitation on the side table or in the kitchen or pin it to a notice board and decide to reply maybe two, three, four weeks from now. We need to respond urgently. And the seeking involves a turning away from something, turning from our sinful thoughts and ways. That's what verse 7 tells us. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's really what repentance is. If you've heard that word before or you've heard it used, repentance is turning from our sin towards God. It's a, there's two parts to the movement. It's seeing the beauty and the glory and the goodness and the grace of the gospel and finding it so compelling that by faith we have to embrace that and then forsake our former way of life. It's recognizing that our thoughts and our ways are not God's thoughts and ways both in terms of the limits of our own wisdom and understanding, which is how we as Christians often often understand these verses, isn't it? 
It's kind of verses we go to when we don't really know how to understand what's going on, but we submit it to God. But it's more precisely in these, this context, it's more in terms of how ungodly they are. The gap between our thoughts and ways and God's thoughts and ways. And look at verse 7. Look at the end of verse 7. What are we, as we turn from our former life, turn from our sin and seek Him, what are we turning to? A compassionate God. A compassionate God who will abundantly pardon. There is nothing you've done in your life. There's no amount of things that you've messed up in that God will not pardon. He's not waiting for you with a clenched fist or a scowl on his face. He's a compassionate, loving father who has his arms open wide to embrace you if we would turn to him. And this is ultimately an invitation from Jesus himself. John 7, 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, uh, which are the verses we preached on our first Sunday. So coming back in many ways to this theme deliberately, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Loved ones, this invitation is open today. If you haven't accepted it, then hear the call to come, to listen, to seek, in order to be satisfied, to live, and to be pardoned. Don't wait. Stop putting it off. Stop putting it off until other things in your life are sorted out. Stop putting it off because you think God won't accept you. Come today. Don't allow the fleeting pleasures of sin and of this world to fill you, to fill me into thinking that they are better. They just aren't. They just aren't. Return to Jesus in repentance and embrace him by faith today as he embraces you with his love. If you've accepted that invitation already, then this morning rejoice in what is yours. Drink and eat afresh of the goodness and the grace of Jesus in your life. Return from where you may be starting to drift and wander into worthless pleasures and empty pursuits. Return in repentance. Be re-embraced by that love, the love which has never gone away, and satisfy your soul in a salvation that's already yours in Christ. Consider, if you're a Christian, how much your life communicates to those around you, communicates to those around us that Jesus is more satisfying than anything. Is that what your friends and family and neighbors think when they witness your life? Does the way we handle our money and spend our time love others, does it communicate that Jesus is everything to us? Or is Jesus just an extra on the side that we squeeze into our weekly schedules? And as a church... As we reflect on the year and look forward to, Lord willing, future years, let's remember the goodness and the richness and the beauty of this invitation. Sometimes we get distracted and we forget how good this really is, how good this invitation is, how much people need to hear this. We underassume how much people long to be invited to this meal. To long for this kind of invitation, this kind of reality, we get to give it to them. Let's commit to being defined by this invitation. It's what we uniquely have to offer to those around us in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in this part of the town. This is what needs to set us apart as a church, as all churches need to be set apart. Lots of places offer community, friendship, practical help, activities for kids and youth. What sets a church apart is at the heart of those things, at the heart of anything it would do, is the gospel invitation to come. To eat and be eternally satisfied. That's why it's on our banners and our signage. You might think that is awfully cheesy and cliche. But that invitation to come is one of eternal significance and promises everlasting rewards. That's why it's there. As a church, let's remember its reach, that it needs to go to all nations. Let's remember its urgency, and let's rest in its certainty and security, because it's an invitation grounded in the everlasting covenant of God, the everlasting new covenant of Jesus. You may be thinking, how can I be sure this invitation isn't a scam? Okay, how is this not spam meal? 
How can we as a church be confident this invitation will be received as we strive to declare it in the years to come? So how can I be sure that this is, worth an, this is an invitation worth taking up? How can we be sure as a church that as we give or proclaim this invitation that it will be received? What keeps us going when we're investing this gospel invitation into a room of energetic children, right? As we invest it, seek to invest it around the chaos of the dinner table, in the noise of the car journey when we're trying to talk about our faith to an apathetic family member or friend. Is this worth it? Will this work? And the promises here were delivered, don't forget, to people who were in exile, far from home, under threat. What assurance did they have that these things were true, that God would follow through in them? Well, that's the second thing we see here. God invites us and God assures us. If you look down at verse 10 to 11, God assures us his promises aren't empty. Here we see that God's promises, his word, when it goes forth, it's like rain, which we've seen a lot more of these past few weeks, right? His word goes forth, it's like rain that comes down and snow, maybe just hold off a little bit on that one, which is water the ground and it produces fruit. These verses are here to assure us both personally and corporately that this invitation, these promises of satisfaction, of life, of forgiveness are not empty promises. This is not make-believe. This is not just good well-wishing. This is true. These are not empty promises. God himself is the, the highest guarantee. And in verse 11, he tells us his word will accomplish what he wants it to. He guarantees it. There's no higher guarantee to get. How can we rely on God's word? God's word which created the world, right? God's word which is sustaining our very breath right now because of how he's proven himself in the past. And ultimately because he sent the word, Jesus, into the world. Jesus stands as the ultimate example and the ultimate guarantee that God follows through on his word, that God accomplishes his purposes real time and space, historical, send Jesus into the world. God follows through on his promises. For you and me then, these promises, this offer is, is real. That means we can believe it and we can receive it with confidence. It reminds us that God works in this world through his word, through the word, Jesus Christ. And as we await Jesus' return, God works through the spirit-empowered proclamation of the good news about Jesus. Reminded me of Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel sees this uh, valley of dry bones, and God asks him, or, or he asks God, the Son of Man, can these bones live? And God then prophesies over the bones. It's the word of the Lord that brings life to those dead, dry bones. It's as God's word goes forth that dry, dead bones, dry, dead lives are brought back to life. And we're going to sing about that as we close. As a church, it means we give ourselves primarily, not exclusively, primarily to word work. And everything we would seek to do would have the word centered at it. It means we give ourselves to invest in the gospel along with the whole counsel of God's word by the power of the Spirit, into one another's lives and into the lives of those we come into contact with on a daily basis. These promises here mean that as we invest that word and sow the seed of the gospel in the home, in the church, in the workplace, we can do so with a confidence that when we proclaim it, God will work. God will work. And he's been gracious to show us that over this past year. God will work. Yes, sometimes the response won't be positive. Just look at how people responded to Jesus. Some will come, some will reject and fall away. But his word doesn't fail. Our words are not wasted. They will accomplish the purpose that he has for them. Where are these promises, this invitation, where are they ultimately taking us? That's the second thing we see here. God assures us that his promises aren't empty and the world, this world is heading for glory. Those who respond to this invitation, who come to Jesus forsaking their sin, shall, will, verse 12, if you look down, will experience joy, 
peace, singing, joy. And it won't just be us who are singing. It will be all creation. Verse 12 and 13 here really point forward to a day when all of creation will declare the glory of God. All of creation will be renewed when Jesus returns. No thorns, no briars, no sin, no suffering, no pain, no tears. And this new creation, this recreation will stand, as verse 13 tells us, as an everlasting sign. Could you get a bigger sign than the whole world being recreated? The whole world being recreated will stand as a sign of the faithfulness and glory of God. Never again will he allow sin, suffering, death, and decay to destroy our lives or this world. So if you need something to sing about right now in your life, maybe you feel you don't, but if you need something to sing about right now, here it is. Here's something to really hope in, to really look forward to, to really anchor and build your life on. And we too, as we thought a moment ago, are like the first readers, we're in exile. And sometimes we struggle to match up our our present day circumstances with these promises, right? We think, really, when is this ever going to happen? Is this ever going to become a reality for me? Sometimes we allow our personal circumstances to do that in our hearts. Maybe as we look at the events that unfold in the world around us, we think, is God ever going to come through? But he will. He already has in Jesus. The work's already begun. He already has in Jesus. And he will complete it when Jesus returns to gather his redeemed people who will be rejoicing as he leads us into a renewed creation. So come. That's the invitation this morning. Come confidently to Jesus, empty-handed, to receive more than you ever thought possible to receive everlasting satisfaction in life. And come based on what he has done for us in dying for our sin so that we might be eternally saved and satisfied. Seek him in faith. Return to him in repentance. And come today. Don't wait. If it's for the first time, then cry out to God now. He will hear you. Or grab someone you know or someone you've come with. Today is the day of salvation. Don't pin this invitation to the back of your mind or to the notice board when you go home. Come either for the first time or as a Christian here who needs to drink afresh of the deep well of salvation that is already yours in Jesus. I'm just going to finish by a couple of verses from uh, an, an older hymn, uh, Come You Sinners. It says this, and it really helpfully summarizes in many ways the invitation, the tone. Come ye weary, heavy laden, bruised and broken by the fall. That could describe our lives in so many ways at so many times, right? Bruised and broken by the fall. If you wait until you're better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous, not the righteous, sinners Jesus came to call. Let not your conscience make you linger, nor think you'll never qualify for him. The only thing that he requires is for you to feel your need of him. This he gives you, this he gives you. It is the Spirit's work within. Let me just pray for us. Jesus, we come to you with empty hands. We come to you with nothing to give you. We come just as we are. For those of us who know you, this is how we first came to you and it's how we still come with all of our failures, with all of our sin, with all the ways that we've messed up in life. We come to you. We bless you that you receive us and our wounds and by your stripes we're healed. You receive us and our sins and by your sin bearing we are set free. You receive us and our death, even our death, for you're the one who was dead and is alive forevermore. We come and lie at your feet, obedient to your call. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Father, I pray for each one of us this morning. Right now, in our hearts, we would feel that sweet rest since we come at your invitation. May some come that have never come until now. 
May others consciously come again, coming to you as a living stone, chosen of God and precious, whom we can build our everlasting hopes on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.